part trying to stay within the time allocated. So uh, a good morning, a good afternoon, a good evening to all. Uh, very happy to have you here on this uh, uh, webinar. Uh, we will discuss, as you can see, the stakeholders compliance and readiness for mail transport and the PLACI regime. Uh, this is a uh, topic that is uh, very, very uh, actual. Uh, we will explain, of course, uh, why. Um, we have around 600 participants who have registered for this uh, uh, webinar, so that shows also the uh, importance of the topic. It is uh, very important for us all to have the, the best awareness possible in uh, implementing uh, the regulation. And uh, you will see uh, throughout uh, the webinar uh, that uh, uh, we want to share experience, we want to share the knowledge uh, so that everyone uh, can implement uh, the requirements. Uh, my name is André Mageres. I'm uh, uh, the head of e-commerce, cargo and mail operations at uh, the International Air Transport Association, IATA. And uh, I started in this industry about 25 years ago, almost 25 years ago and uh, joined IATA about nine years ago. And when I joined IATA nine years ago, this was actually the very first topic that landed on my desk. And uh, I must say I'm quite happy or even thrilled to see that it's coming into effect now because we've been working for so long uh, to ensure compliance that I'm, I'm really happy to see it uh, uh, finally happening. Um, in the last years, IATA and UPU have uh, really worked very, very hard uh, to provide guidance to the industry. So uh, today you are going to uh, uh, be able to witness the experience from uh, many stakeholders. Uh, but of course, we will remain at your disposal uh, should you have any question. And of course, if you need any uh, implementation guidance, uh, that's something also that we will be able to uh, provide. We uh, do have a fantastic line lineup of speakers today uh, from the airline industry and the postal industry as well. Um, so I'm pretty sure that you will be able to learn from their experience in implementing uh, all those requirements. Uh, please be reminded that uh, uh, there will be a little bit of time allocated after each session uh, for you to ask a question. So there is a chat box that you can use for that. You can raise hands. Uh, we will then try to provide uh, the floor to uh, all of you. Uh, um, but at some point, we will have, of course, to continue with the webinar. Uh, so uh, if we do not have time to take your questions again, put them in the chat. We'll take care of them afterwards and we'll reply to you. And otherwise, you can contact us all individually by email. This is also uh, perfectly okay. Uh, finally, I have just one last word before I hand it over to my colleague, uh, Jan Bosnanski. Um, please be reminded that uh, we are under uh, competition law guidance, uh, so which means that we will not be able to discuss anything related to uh, uh, contracts, charges, surcharges, uh, uh, capacity, uh, allocation of capacity, customers, uh, or even any strategy for individual companies. We are not going to uh, discuss um, any uh, non-participants uh, intention or non-intention regarding business. Uh, so if I unfortunately hear questions that are not appropriate or not in compliance with the competition law guidelines, uh, I will have to ask you uh, to stop asking those questions or to have that conversation. And unfortunately, if the conversation continues, I have to mute you and maybe even expel you from the webinar. So uh, without further ado, I would like to hand over to my colleague Jan Bojnanski from the Universal Postal Union. And uh, I wish you an excellent webinar. And again, remain at your disposal for any questions. So thank you, thank you very much. Jan, I think the floor is yours. Thank you, Andre, for getting me a floor. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good, good evening to all of you participating uh, uh, anywhere on the planet. Uh, I, I, I see a really very nice uh, number of participants already. Uh, 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 and uh, I hope that uh, even more will join us. Uh, uh, as Andre mentioned, it's a very hot topic. ICS2 release 2 is, uh, is uh, discussed uh, in all our meetings. And uh, uh, we know that uh, 
uh, ICS2 release 2 is even more complicated and more challenging than ICS2 release, uh, release 1. Uh, I hope that uh, uh, we will be able to uh, provide a little bit more information uh, uh, regarding the readiness challenges or expectations from all stakeholders. Uh, uh, we will have a, a nice presentations regarding the readiness of member states uh, uh, from the European Commission. Uh, we would like to give a floor uh, to Lufthansa, uh, represent carriers, uh, to present their readiness and their expectations. Uh, uh, we will give a floor uh, to two designated operators, one from EU and uh, one from non-EU, uh, to, uh, to uh, present their uh, view and their readiness. And of course, we will uh, give a floor also to two IT providers, not only to IPC as mentioned in the in the invitation, but also uh, to Postal Technology Center uh, to uh, let uh, people know uh, how they could uh, help uh, carriers or posts uh, to provide information needed. Uh, I'd like to say uh, that uh, this webinar will not be focused on some uh, issues which are still not, uh, not fixed. Uh, we know we discuss a lot about some fundamental legal issues. I don't want to discuss these issues now. We still have ongoing discussion with European Commission. Uh, also, other st stakeholders are in touch with us and with the European Commission. We would like to focus today on, uh, for, uh, on sharing information, sharing readiness, and give the floor uh, to participants to raise questions uh, to speakers. Uh, <clears throat> uh, I'd like to uh, go to the next slide very shortly. Uh, start with uh, uh, information regarding the readiness of uh, uh, designated operators. So I'd like to ask to move to the second slide uh, on which, next one, please. Uh, because uh, European, uh, the, the all stakeholders are doing their best to prepare, uh, uh, um, to meet all uh, requirements. I'd like to speak uh, about EAD requirements because uh, European Commission is not only one region uh, uh, requiring uh, uh, EAD data. We have already uh, nearly 100 UPU uh, members, countries, which uh, declared uh, EAD requirements. That's the reason why on the next slide, uh, we are talking about the global postal model. We try to implement to meet all requirements, not only from ICS to release to, but also from other regions uh, uh, through this uh, uh, global postal model. We, uh, I don't want to speak about that model in details. Uh, we presented that model many times. This is, uh, this is a platform uh, through which we would like to exchange all data between all stakeholders. Uh, uh, it means between posts, carriers, and customs. On this slide, I just wanted to show you uh, the progress uh, which we made in the postal industry uh, regarding the readiness of member countries to exchange this data. You can see that uh, 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 in May, in April, on 1st of May, when we uh, analyzed this data, uh, we had already 200 member countries, 201 member countries sending minimum one ultimate message, which is message sent to customs in destination country. Uh, we had already 180 designated operators or posts around the world sending minimum one carded message to carrier. And uh, as you can see uh, with a light blue uh, column, we had in, uh, in April uh, 90, uh, 89 designated operators sending also AR flag within the carded message. When we consider that we have uh, additional 27 plus two EU member countries, which are not obliged to provide AR flag, it means that we have already around 120 uh, posts sending the AR flag in April. And we do a lot of capacity building activities uh, uh, in all regions uh, uh, to uh, increase this number. And I'm sure that in May, it will be even more uh, designated operators ready to 
provide all information needed for carriers uh, uh, to uh, to uh, need their uh, requirements for filing to destination customs. Through this slide, I just wanted to show that we really do a lot uh, to help designated operators. We provided for them not only trainings, capacity building, uh, through capacity building activities, but we uh, prepared a lot of IT tools. Uh, today, also IPC and also PTC will present some of them. Uh, which are uh, good for carriers or, or posts. Uh, and uh, uh, that's the reason also why uh, we can see this progress. But we know that it's not only important to, in, uh, to transmit the data, it's important also to provide good quality of all data. Uh, AR flag will be extremely important for, uh, for uh, carriers. It was agreed within the IATA UPU contact committee. It will be confirmation from origin designated operator that uh, uh, all mail ready for handover is meeting requirements, EAD requirements in country of destinations. We are analyzing through compliance reports uh, uh, all details and all, all quality of this data. And on the next slide, I can show you that now we are focusing really on, on the AR flag in details. Uh, du during the last few uh, weeks, we are in touch with all designated operators to improve the quality of AR flag uh, because there are some problems with, uh, uh, for example, uh, declared specific reference ID, which was uh, missing in many AR flags and which will be probably important for carriers. So I just wanted to, uh, uh, through these slides, to show you that uh, we did a lot, we improved a lot, but it's still clear that not all designated operators will be ready on 100%. On the last slide, which I would like to present before we will give a floor to uh, our um, speakers, I'd like to uh, uh, just share this uh, ICS to release to deployment window uh, um, timeline. Uh, um, uh, I hope that we will uh, get uh, the latest information today from the European Commission uh, regarding the member states' readiness, because we know very well that even if they should be ready from 1st of March, uh, half of them, roughly uh, half of them, uh, were not re ready and uh, have a deployment derogation until 30th of June, or as I understood, some of them even later. Uh, but uh, uh, we hope that we will get also uh, guidance or cl clarity from the European Commission today, whether uh, if some of these member states will not be ready, uh, it, sh it should not affect uh, the deployment of uh, air carriers within the transition period established for them. It means uh, between uh, uh, from from uh, from first uh, uh, of July, uh, I can confirm that European that uh, International Bureau of UPU is not asking for any any postponement of deadline uh, proposed uh, by uh, the European Commission because we think that we need we, we do a lot uh, uh, to be ready. And if somebody is not ready, we need to help, we need to monitor, and we just ask, we are just asking for some kind of gradual implementation with monitoring the problems and not, uh, not uh, be very strict, if possible, to, uh, to, uh, uh, to, we would like to avoid any partial or even full stop of major international e-commerce flows uh, from uh, 2nd of October. So uh, I just wanted to start uh, from positive side, I would say, uh, to say that we do a lot, uh, we improved a lot, but of course to confirm that not everything is perfect and we expect uh, some problems, but we expect also support from uh, other, stakehold other stakeholders like carriers and, uh, and customs member states uh, uh, to... Uh, mm, to implement uh, these requirements uh, smoothly uh, and in uh, and gradually. So uh, that's uh, from my side as an introduction. And uh, without any any uh, additional uh, comments, I'd like to uh, give a floor to our first speaker. It's uh, Renata. Pablo Kaitite uh, from uh, from the European Commission, 
we all know uh, uh, Renata from many other meetings uh, uh, when we, yes, Andre? Yeah, just, just sorry, just uh, sorry to interrupt. Just reminding every participant that at the end of the webinar, you will be able to uh, provide us with your feedback through a survey uh, with a QR code, should you wish to do it instantly, or you will get an email uh, with a link uh, for us to understand if you did like uh, the sessions and also to uh, know what we can do better for you in the future or different topics and so on. So please remember to complete the survey. Sorry for the interruption. Hey, thank you very much, Andre. Uh, you are uh, right and uh, accept this uh, link to the survey. You will uh, receive after the webinar also link uh, uh, to uh, for uh, master slide deck and also recording from that from this webinar. So uh, you should have all information needed. But now, if I may, I'd like to give a floor to Renata. Uh, and uh, she will present uh, the European Commission view on the readiness and maybe some other information important for us. Renata, floor is yours. Thank you very much, Jan. Uh, greetings to all the participants of this event and thank you to the IATA and UPU colleagues for inviting me to speak on this event, uh, which I see has a huge uh, interest. And uh, today I am going to speak about the readiness or the status of the readiness of the member states for the ICS2 release 2 launch and also a bit uh, go through the expectations or requirements uh, uh, for release that bring that release 2 brings uh, for, uh, to the, for the carriers and the uh, postal operators, both EU based and non EU based. And uh, Andrea already mentioned that uh, this uh, ICS2 uh, story started uh, nine, nearly 10 years ago. In 2013, we had uh, the legal requirements adopted. And from uh, since that day, we started uh, the, the journey of uh, developing the ICS2 system to support the implementation of those legal requirements, uh, which uh, bring uh, new uh, let's say new um, requirements for the postal operators as regards uh, the postal um, mail and uh, cargo uh, let's move to the next slide so uh, as you know uh, we have started the, the ics to release 2 on 1st of march this year uh, however not all eu member states uh, were uh, ready to uh, with their national uh, ICS2 system components uh, to uh, receive uh, and to process uh, the data uh, from the carriers and the postal operators. And that's for uh, why uh, 12 of them were granted a derogation. And then we had a couple of other member states which were simply not able to uh, technically connect their systems and, and be ready. So uh, for today, uh, we have 15 member states, EU member states and Switzerland, Norway and Northern Ireland um, connected to the system. Uh, and ready to uh, process, uh, risk assess the uh, entry summary declarations in release two. Uh, then we have um, I think, uh, 11 uh, member states that have already deployed or are in the process of finalizing the deployment of their ICS2 release two components by the 1st of July. Uh, some countries like Belgium, I think Luxembourg have already started, uh, some other we have partial operations, but nevertheless, by the 1st of July, uh, these countries uh, will be up and running. And then we have the last group of uh, four member states, Estonia, Greece, Denmark, and Romania, uh, which will deploy their systems either by the 2nd of uh, October this year or uh, even later. Uh, this is not very good news, of course, for all of us, because uh, this creates some operational uh, difficulties. And for this reason, we have uh, uh, issued a guidance before go live uh, to the member states and also basically um, uh, suggesting that uh, all the uh, air carriers which were supposed to connect to the system between the 1st of March and 1st of July are granted with a deployment window until 1st of July and uh, giving enough time then for the member states to finish their work and also for the uh, air carriers to connect their system to the ICS2. Let's move to the next slide. Now, what does it mean, this state of readiness of the member states, what does it mean for the economic operators? 
Uh, so, uh, first of all, uh, just uh, useful information on our ICS2 web page. We uh, constantly update uh, the go live planning of these member states. So, if you are curious or if you want to see whether the member state in which, for example, uh, you are registered uh, is already connected uh, to the system or not, you can always check it there. Uh, now, as regards the operations, uh, so uh, the derogation granted to the member state was until the 30th of June uh, this year, in, which means that after the 1st of July, uh, those member states that are on time, they will connect and they will start uh, processing entry summer declarations as uh, expected. And those uh, that will not be ready will have to implement uh, the measures foreseen in the ICS2 business continuity plan. You can also find this business continuity plan published uh, on Circa webpage. I have included the link in my slides uh, for easier access. Uh, what does it mean for the economic operators? So for the air carriers, because they will be the ones connecting to the ICS2 on the 1st of July, they uh, will start filing their ENSs into ICS2. Until now, they are filing into ICS1. Um, and those member states that are not ready, uh, they will have to um, implement, as I said, the measures foreseen in the business continuity plan and uh, perform the risk assessment, uh, not via the ICS2 uh, system components, but uh, using other means. For the economic operators, um, the filing uh, is done uh, into ICS2. Um, they do not have to file anything into ICS-1 anymore after they uh, have started filing uh, uh, into ICS-2. And um, also the other notification, like arrival notification, follows the same uh, route as the e ENS. So it can be filed via the ICS-2 uh, shared reader interface. And there is no need for that to be connected to any national uh, component. Uh, so here is a brief um, uh, yeah, overview of the state of play of the member state readiness. Uh, now let's move on to the requirements uh, to the economic operators as regards the ICS2 release two requirements. So first of all, for the air carriers, uh, now from the 1st of July, uh, for all the goods that are destined to or that are transiting via the EU, or uh, yeah, uh, the uh, air carrier is expected to uh, file a master postal ENS uh, filing, so F42 uh, filing uh, for, for, for these goods. And then uh, it's also the responsibility of the carrier uh, to act op upon the uh, do not load instructions in case such would be issued meaning that they shall not uh, load the goods on the aircraft if a do not load instructions were uh, issued by the EU Customs Authority. It is also um, a responsibility of the air carriers to um, uh, respond to uh, referrals uh, on the entry summary declarations which might be issued by the EU Customs Authority in case they are the declarant to which such a referral is issued, or in case, uh, especially in case of the um, mail uh, consignments, or postal consignments, to, to make sure that uh, the referrals that are issued to the uh, uh, postal operator, that those re referrals are closed, meaning either the uh, required additional information is provided, or the high-risk uh, cargo and mail screening is performed, or that the postal operator has handed over the consignments for the um, responsible authority or the carrier who ha uh, has this, uh, the, the right status to perform such screening. Uh, or if the air carrier, of course, is... Um, Oh, Diane, can we have uh, an update? You're on mute, Jan. I'm sorry, we had some problem in IB with connection. So also me and, and also... It's back. ...that also be back soon and we'll continue with slides. I'm sorry for that. Odd, can you... Can yeah, you my connection is back. Yeah. Thank you. I'm sorry for that. <clears throat> Mm 
Can you see the slide? Not yet. Okay. Okay, can we go one slide back, please? And one more. Okay, thank you very much. So uh, let's continue. As uh, I said, for the goods destined or transiting via the EU, uh, these are the three main requirements for the uh, air carriers. So lodging the master level postal ENS filing, uh, ensuring that do not load instructions are followed up and also uh, ensuring that um, the cargo that is arriving does not have any open referrals or if the um, commercial um, the air carrier takes a commercial decision uh, to bring such goods into the EU then of course uh, uh, they need to be aware that there might be some uh, measures uh, due to the non-compliance to the EU customs uh, regulations uh, uh, taken um, in these cases. Let's move to the next slide then. Then uh, we have also uh, the postal consignments that are transshipped via the EU. Uh, here we have uh, at the end of the last year, we have a uh, uh, update of the legal requirements uh, in our um, uh, delegated, uh, delegated act uh, uh, adopted. Uh, which require now an ENS to be uh, lodged either by the air carrier or the postal operator at origin. And uh, as regards the air carrier, uh, so uh, first of all, the air carrier, of course, has to lodge the master level ENS, so F42 filing for, for these consignments, and then uh, either file the the F42, F44, or ITMAT and PREDES uh, uh, data themselves, or arrange this with the origin postal operator that these postal operators will file. Uh, in case the air carrier would arrange with the postal operator outside the EU to lodge uh, this information, then the postal of origin postal operator would have to uh, get the ORI registration in the EU, in one of the EU member states, and uh, uh, either connect to the system themselves or use the IT service provider or use a, a representative or use our um, web portal, basically, uh, where uh, this, such information can be lodged. Uh, then, if uh, the customs authority would issue a do not load, uh, again, uh, it is responsibility of the carrier to make sure that uh, such consignments are not loaded on, on the aircraft uh, this time to the EU. And open referrals. Uh, for the consignments that they are bringing in. Now, in the case where uh, the carrier would decide that they would file F43 and F44 filings themselves, uh, since this is not a master level filing, but house level filing, uh, what they can do is they can ask the um, responsible member state uh, to grant them with the deployment window for the F43 and F44 
Benata. Can you yes. see my screen? Yes, I can. Yeah, so I took over uh, sharing my screen. It's a PDF, but uh, please tell me if you want me to uh, move on, I'll, I'll do. Okay, perfect. I, I can continue from, uh, from this slide. Um, so now uh, for the for the transshipment cargo, because I think for the cargo that is destined to the EU or transiting via the EU, there we have the EU postal operators uh, responsible to file the house level information, and then we have the carriers filing the master level information. But for the um, transshipment cargo, where there is no involvement of the EU postal operators and the uh, ENS requirements have to be met by the air carrier and or, uh, yeah, <laughs> possibly in combination with the origin postal operator and the air carriers have to uh, basically decide uh, uh, and choose one of the several options maybe several options from from the list uh, what they plan to do uh, so first of all um, if uh, they are able to uh, uh, reach an agreement with the postal operator at origin, that the origin postal operator will file the necessary um, information from ITMAT and from Freedest, uh, then the uh, air carrier only has the obligation to lodge the master level information. But in case they could not reach a, such uh, uh, an agreement, and in case the uh, uh, origin postal operator would not be uh, providing the necessary data for the air carrier to file uh, the full ENS uh, into ICS2, uh, then of course the air carriers uh, would have to make a decision whether to transport the goods and take the responsibility of non-compliance, meaning that their ENS is not complete, uh, to, or to arrange the transport of goods not uh, passing via the EU customs territory, um, or also uh, another option is to, to arrange uh, with the origin postal operator that the goods are sent in the postal transit, not as a transshipment cargo, uh, implying that the, ori uh, then, uh, the origin postal operator establishes um, the necessary arrangement with the EU, Switzerland and Norway based postal operators and send the consignments in the uh, postal transit. So uh, these are the, the, the options, of course, the most preferred would be that uh, the data, necessary data is uh, available and is uh, either provided to the air carriers by the origin postal operators or that they file themselves. Uh, but in case this is not happening, then uh, it is the decision of the air carriers uh, uh, what to do next with such consignments. Let's move on to the next slide. Then, uh, as regards the requirements for the postal operators, so uh, for the goods that are destined to or that are in postal transit via the EU, the EU postal operator uh, have the uh, legal uh, obligation to, um, first of all, fulfill the release one obligations until the end of the granted deployment window. And here, um, most of you have received the, the deployment window until the 2nd of October. We know that, in, or we were made aware last week that some operators got their uh, this deployment window only until 1st of July. Uh, so uh, uh, the European Commission has issued a, a letter to the member states uh, recommending them to extend that deployment window until the 2nd of October so that everybody has uh, the same uh, time frame to uh, uh, prepare for the release two uh, uh, requirements. And uh, then, of course, from the 2nd of October, the EU, uh, Switzerland and Norway postal and Northern Ireland postal operators will have to fulfill release two obligations, uh, which means that uh, in addition to the data that they were filing already in release one, they will have to provide the HS six digit uh, commodity code, uh, type of the person for the commercial uh, parcels, uh, consignee or in number in case that consignee has one, and um, also ENS for all items in transit. Because in release one, we had kind of a gradual deployment of ICS2 and there were less data required to be provided by the postal operator. And also the scope uh, 
only the goods that were destined to the EU were covered by the obligations of uh, ICS2, and all the um, consignments that were transiting the EU were exempt from the obligation to lodge an ENS. So, uh, with at least two, we're extending the scope in the uh, in the sense what consignments uh, now have to be covered by an ENS. <laughs> Let's go to the next slide. And then uh, the in, for the goods that are transshipped or will be transshipped via the EU, uh, the origin postal operators uh, are, they have to file the F43 and F44 ENS filings themselves, or they need to provide the it, to provide the ITMAT and uh, previous data to the air carrier so that the carrier can comply with the EU uh, customs requirements and file the NSs themselves. Alternatively, of course, uh, it's possible to um, send the postal consignments in transit as opposed to the transshipment and then uh, to establish the necessary arrangements with the postal operators in EU, which will then file uh, the necessary filings uh, into ICS2. And again, um, as in the previous case with the air carriers, the uh, origin postal operators again can be granted a deployment window until the 2nd of October uh, for the filing of F43 and F44 submissions. And this, uh, such a deployment window then can be granted by the member state, uh, which would be registering that operator for the ORI number and uh, helping that operator to connect to the ICS2 system. And I think this is the end of my presentation. Now, if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer those. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Renata. Uh, sorry about the technical difficulties. Uh, I'm just uh, trying to check now with uh, UPU. Is the problem solved on your side? Should I hand over to you again? Uh. I hope that it's solved, but uh, we still do not know what had happened. Uh, it happened uh, three times, uh, so we are also not happy from that. But uh, I hope that we can continue. Uh, I saw some uh, questions uh, in the in the chat uh, for uh, <clears throat> Renata, but most of them were already answered by me or by by uh, Andre. Thanks, Andre, for for your support. Uh, I do not know any raise hand at this moment. So now it's a time when you can raise a hand and ask uh, Renata some question if, if needed. So uh, I do not see, but regarding the question, yes. yes? Yeah, there is one, uh, two, we have uh, Freddie Thomas, I look at here. Freddie Thomas, uh, can you take the floor, maybe? I saw your name. Nope. Okay. Anyone else with a raised hand? I do not see any raised hands. Maybe there are some questions. I see I see a few raised hands here. Freddie, Tomax, oh, allowed to talk. Here we go. Go ahead, Freddie. Thank you. Thank you, Andrea. Hope I'm audible. You are. Uh, so a question from my end. Uh, in the slide, I see us to release through timelines. You had mentioned about the AR flag uh, representing that filing has been carried out and no outstanding referrals uh, exist. Uh, I was just, my query is with regards to the AR flag. It cannot, can it be considered as an AC? And in case there is an amended referral, how would that be communicated to us as a carrier? I forgot to introduce myself. My name is Freddie. I'm from Emirates Sky Cargo. I don't know okay. uh, whether Renata will start with answering or whether. We should. I can maybe start with uh, explaining that uh, the AR flag is the uh, arrangement between the air carriers and the postal operators. And uh, of course, from the uh, EU Customs Authority side, uh, this is not a um, an indication that you know the um, the risk analysis, for example, have been complete or there are no open referrals because we do not see. 
uh, based on what information the AR flag is issued. We hope that it is issued on the assessment completes that are sent for each and every um, postal item. Uh, but this is really a, a commercial arrangement. This is not something that customs authorities provide as such, and this is not something that customs authorities will uh, take, uh, you know, as the, for example, um, indication that all the referrals had been closed by the postal operator, for example. Uh, from our side, uh, we issue a referral. We expect to receive um, a reply to that referral. Uh, depending on type of referral, either the information is provided or uh, information about the results of uh, high-risk cargo mail screening are provided, and then uh, assessment complete is sent back to the postal operator who lodged uh, the ENS filings. And then that information, in case, for example, the ENS filing is done by the EU postal operator, should be transmitted to the origin postal operator so that that party also is aware that um, the risk assessment on the EU customs authority site has been completed and that there is no do not load. That's the most important part. And of course, that there are no open referrals and then that the goods can be loaded and uh, transported to the EU. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Renata. Just one qu follow-up question on that point. In case there is an uh, the mail consignment is tendered for acceptance to the carrier, we accept it, and thereafter there is an amended uh, referral that flows in. Do we have a provision? Uh, has a provision been looked into for the original post lobby to do, thereafter communicate it to the carrier? I then have no. one more question. Twin. Normally, if there is assessment complete had be, had been issued, there would be no referral. Uh, following that, because assessment complete means that customs authorities have finished the risk assessment process on that particular ENS. So there should be no referral. Uh, the referral can be followed by another referral, for example, in case you received a, a, a referral for additional information or amendment. That referral was not replied. And they say customs authority says, okay, we then uh, kind of escalate this case and we issue referral for the high risk cargo meal screening. So, this is the situation where you might have two referrals. Uh, or another situation would be that response to the re request for information is really not sufficient, the risk is not mitigated, and then a re referral for screening would be issued. But just to have an assessment complete and then to have another referral this is not uh, really a likely situation unless something really something really bad is happening but but i would excuse that situation, situation. yeah uh, thank you renata for that uh, we were uh, during one of our discussions it came up that there could be an intelligence update and thereafter an ac referral may uh, the likelihood or the possibility of that happening is pretty scarce but it could be that uh, they might revert the status to rfi or rfs and therefore the question. Uh, I, I also wanted to uh, ask for a status update. A request for change was raised under 22006 uh, for a, an entity to query on, on the status, on the PNASI status of a filing that has been carried out. We were uh, wondering, hoping that the carrier would be able to make use of this particular query uh, to ask for the status update of a postal mail consignment um, if in case an AC referral has not been assigned. And would you be aware if uh, this request for change has been approved? Yes. The request for change was approved on the basically 10th of May. Uh, the, however, the implementation, of course, will take time because this is uh, quite a heavy change on the um, central components. So luckily, no member state changes are required. Uh, but this is a heavy change, and we will implement it. The, the current planning is to have it uh, by the. Uh, yeah. no, I'm confused, but I think at the next year or 2025. Um, no, I think it's for for the start of the release three, so it should be uh, sometime uh, May uh, next year. But uh, we will communicate about uh, the. Um, about the exact uh, date of deployment of such functionality. But the good thing is the functionality is approved. Uh, our IT developers uh, are working on it and it will be uh, available to the air carriers to query this information. Yeah, thank you. That's all from my end. Thank you very much. Thank you.
thank you very much, Fred, Freddie. Um, I'm conscious uh, of the time, but I will still give the floor to two more. So uh, second in line, Rogazaino Andrea, uh, can you please uh, take the floor? Yeah, thank you, um, Rugasiana from South Sudan. Uh, as we attended this uh, this meeting, we see that there are some countries that have not been uh, uh, installed, does not have not installed the IPS dot system. So, is there any solution for them to use, or we just remain until we get connected to the system? Thank you. No, so. Um... As I mentioned already, uh, ICS2 system, it's a very complex system consisting of many components and the central components are deployed since 1st of March. And we are able to uh, receive, register and process the entry summary declarations lodged by the economic operators. And uh, that's what will happen from the 1st of July. When the air carriers start filing, they will be filing into that system. And then the member states will uh, do the risk assessment by using other means than uh, what is uh, foreseen, let's say, in their ICS2 national components. Um, that is uh, provided in the business continuity plan. Uh, so member states either do that uh, depending on their development, because uh, we have encouraged member states to uh, be agile and to uh, de deploy the function partial functionality as soon as they have it. So they might be able to risk assess it into their ICS2 release two uh, components. If not, they will be doing that on the basis of the, for example, temporary storage declaration. So there, there is a number of means that member states can use. Uh, uh, to do their part of, of, the, of the tasks. Uh, the tasks of the economic operators is to lodge, the NE, to lodge an ENS, to respond to the referrals, and all that can be done via the ICS2 system. Thank you very much, uh, Renata. I, I will, if you're okay, allow one last question. I know that there are multiple hand raised, uh, but please, if you have uh, questions, put them in the chat. We will then answer them individually uh, after the webinar. I'm looking at the time and it's, uh, uh, well, there are other speakers uh, waiting to get the floor. So I will allow just maybe uh, Jinan al uh sorry about the pronunciation. Maybe you could just provide the last question and uh, then we will continue. Jinan? Jinan, can you hear me? If not, then I will pass. Hello? Yeah. Yes, hello. Uh, I asked if you can to provide us the, the all files uh, for IECS2, uh, if you can, possible. Can you repeat the question because I could not get the first part of it. Oh, uh, I ask if you can to provide us uh, the all files uh, for the IECS2 uh, document. Uh, all the documentation is published um, on the Circa BC web page. This is the official publication platform for the European Commission. Um, we, I can put uh, a link in the chat where you can access all the documentation. Oh, oh thank you. Thank you very much. All right, thank you very, very much for everyone to uh, uh, have raised all these interesting questions. Uh, again, for the sake of the time, I think we will have to move on a little bit. Uh, I have asked the participants who raised their hands to uh, uh, and who did not have the chance to, uh, to take the floor to provide their questions in the chat. Uh, Renata, if you want to have a look at the chat, you can maybe answer a few of those questions. Otherwise, we'll take the time after the webinar to, of course, get back to you. So, Thank you very much again. Uh, thanks, Renata. Uh, I think okay. we can move on, if uh, that's okay with you. Yes. So let's continue. Thank you. Next in line, uh, Rani uh, from Lufthansa Cargo will provide you with a airline experience on the compliance and the PLASI regime. So Rani, I'll give you the floor. 
Thanks very much, Andre, Thank also you. for facilitating and giving us as a carrier the opportunity to speak here, share our experiences and concerns regarding this implementation that is yeah, about to hit us quite soon in about one month for carriers. Uh, my name is Rani Joseph George, as Andre said, Senior Manager Customs and Authorities for Lufthansa Cargo. And if you would be so kind as to go to the first slide. Yes, so unlike um, Airmail and Express that uh, basically had a, let's say, phased implementation, part of it starting in release one and part of it starting in release two, we as carriers have a full on PLASI as well as pre-arrival reporting that will be uh, starting on 1st of July, as uh, already mentioned today. Um, this whole requirement of ICS2 has been known for quite some time. And as is often the case in large companies, a lot of providers involved, complicated IT landscape and so on, a lot of stakeholders internally, different business departments. We have indeed been looking into the subject for quite a long time, as you can see in this sort of timely overview of what we have been busy with for the past five years in order to ensure compliance. So as early as 2018, we looked into the requirements and were faced regarding airmail with the decision, do we stick with the existing system that we are using for airmail handling and upgrade the one? Or is this the chance to sort of change providers and integrate it into the module I'm airmail module of our cargo handling system provider. Then next year after that, we determined the scope of the project looking into airmail IT, and we decided that there will be two separate projects to make this happen. One will be focused more on the ICS2 requirement side, and the other one will be more about implementing the new mail IT system the technical and processual implementation as that. So from this, you can see that the decision we were first faced with ended in the decision to actually change the system. Then, of course, as you always have, sort of an RFP to look into providers, see what is on the market, what is suitable for us, have negotiations, scope with the providers to see what all shall be and can be implemented. And in August 21 was the official kickoff of the project uh, titled Airmail IT New Fulfillment that uh, has been going on since then. As of today, we have rolled out the new IT um, and also rolled out 100 plus scanner stations, meaning handheld scanners are used for the acceptance of any airmail receptacles. And yeah, the next milestone, which is yet to be reached, will be the carrier go live for ICS2 release two on the 1st of July in 2023. Andre? Thank you. So what we had to look in comes from many walks in life. Um, I, we have tried to put together a presentation that is uh, hopefully understandable to everyone without going in too much business or too much technical detail. So we have tried to sort of cluster some aspects that we had to consider. So first cluster we came up with is sort of customs and external factors. For example, the postal airway bill. So you have to decide who is going to issue that. Will it be the postal operator or will it be the airline? Um, a late referral or let's uh, stick with the new term that has recently evolved a revised referral because I think it is more clear as to what we're trying to say. Uh, what are the lines of communication? I think there was also just a question on that which is understandable. And also what is the risk for us as carrier? assessment complete or AR flag, how is it going to be provided? Also, very big point, the readiness of the postal operators, uh, IT map messaging on part of the postal operators and also carded abilities. 
Of course, the readiness of EU member states is also of relevance. They should be able to accept messages and also provide the assessment complete to all uh, submitted uh, PLACI filings. And then um, another big block is converting carded data. So we've had to newly implement the mail aspect into our cargo messaging world, let us say. So how do we take the carded data and actually turn it into something that matches our, our way of messaging? So internally, we looked at the postal airway bill because now we need to include postal airway bills into airway bill stock management, need to avoid clashes with other processes where mail might already be flying on airway bills, such as US requirements that have been in place for years. And also to think of how do we handle consignments because not all authorities have the requirement of a postal airway bill that will continue to not have a postal airway bill. So that will continue just to travel on a consignment number. All of that needs to work together without redundancies, without causing a glitch somewhere in the process. Also scanning at every station, we did uh, want to implement a sort of security net for ourselves to ensure scanning, to ensure that carded data has been received for every relevant consignment. How do you implement that in the, in the practical world? Will it be Lufthansa equipment? What do we do at stations where it is not our own staff handling, but a GHA might be handling the mail? This in turn might have contractual uh, repercussions. So with any DHA, we might have to look into what they're currently doing for us and might have to sort of upgrade the contract to include the uh, processual changes. Also the question, what about transit at our EU hubs? So obviously as an EU-based carrier, our hubs uh, for our business model are located in the EU. So um, we don't really have the possibility of routing anything without touching the EU. Therefore, how do we deal with the risk for some business volumes here? Also, there was some thoughts whether there might be the risk of revenue loss where operators would try to select maybe rather a carrier that has the possibility not to touch the EU in their routings when offering to transport airmail. Another point is transfer at or to interline uh, at non-EU stations. So if another airline is the one issuing the airway bill and we get the mail at a certain point, who will take care of the ICS2 requirements? Where is the card it going to come from? How do the IT systems connect? Because what we have done is obviously something we had to decide for our own. How would other carriers handle it? And of course, vice versa, if we might be the first carrier affected in any routing and hand over any airmail to another carrier outside of the EU. Last point we have listed was how to handle any exceptions such as letter and military mail that are, as per our understanding at least, um, exempt from ICS2 reporting. Andre, next please. Yes, so by taking all the previously mentioned factors into consideration, we had uh, the following outcomes that necessitated some processual and also technical changes. So what we have decided to implement is an acceptance check for ensuring that the AR flag is present in all relevant, as in subject to ICS2 in this case, postal consignments. Therefore, the previously already mentioned scan is a must. So basically, we get a receptacle, we scan it to ensure everything is in order, and only if it meets the requirement can it be accepted. How do we deal with the handling of referrals? 
So we have had to set up a new central team as the required 24-7 single point of contract for the authorities and also coordination for the mail side between any DPO that informs us of a referral and possibly also the authorities and involved stations, of course. So what was entirely new is that now we have a regime that involves both airmail and cargo. Um, depending on where you are from, when you are listening here, you might or might not realize that generally, or up till now at least, for a carrier, airmail handling and other cargo handling can be quite separate streams which don't necessarily speak to each other. So we had to find a way to sort of combine them because in the end, as already stated here very clearly by uh, Renata, <clears throat> we as carrier have the obligation to send the F-42 for airmail. So in other words, include airmail in our pre-arrival reporting, which previously was only cargo. And also trans, um, temporary storage for airmail will be required to sort of finish off the whole ICS2 project, uh, process, which is also very new to us uh, as a carrier and had to be newly established both processually and also, of course, on the IT side. So to achieve that, um, one of the first things we had to do is bring the airmail and cargo messaging together for the reporting purposes. As I said, uh, it was quite, quite a separate uh, handling stream for airmail. And of course, the, the airmail world has their own messaging uh, mentioned here before, such as ITMAT, uh, CARDIT, uh, RESDIT, PREDES, etc that is not necessarily, let's call it airline language and is not what our systems typically know. So for this, um, we also implemented, for example, the um, mapping recommendations to convert CARDIT to what we call an XFWB, FWB in the cargo world that uh, were also provided by IATA. So this is a way of sort of, uh, let's say translation uh, between the different languages to help us to handle airmail data for our reporting to, to ICS2. So for that alone, you have implications in different systems. It is our cargo handling system. It is the third party Customs uh, to Germany provider for our case, uh, two of our main hubs are in Germany. And of course, the, our third party system that we use as an interface to EU customs. Especially for the temporary storage, we've also had to set up an entirely new connection stream and relating mapping in the clearing center of our provider for German customs reporting in order to be able to actually uh, acknowledge that any receptacle involved has reached EU from third country and is now in our temporary storage possession. The mapping for the F-42, I have basically already mentioned, used the conversion guidelines and then also for our provider, it was a new thing to handle airmail to implement our messages that we gather from the mapping that I mentioned, supply it to our third party provider, actually having the interface to EU customs, it is them that is certified. So they also had to implement that in order to be able to fulfill this F-42 or pre-arrival master level reporting for airmen for us as a carrier. Um, having mentioned messaging, also some parameters were required as system changes to be able to differentiate when do I want to include airmail into the cargo messaging for the EU, I will want to for any other countries or other recipients such as the GHA in a non affected country, I will not want to include that into the messaging because it will not be relevant and only confusing for them. 
the implementation of the postal airway bill mapping. So basically one carded will be the equivalent of one postal airway bill and one receptacle for us in airline language, as I said, uh, would be one house airway bill to make the two worlds compatible. Also a new service for the postal airway bill stock had to be introduced because previously we had no automatic assignment of any airway bill numbers to postal consignments. Of course, this has to be integrated and considered in the system that controls the available post the available airway bill stock numbers, also how long everyone should be blocked depending on which country you might be going to and there might be different customs requirements on how soon you can reuse that airway bill number going to the pertaining country. And also some new parameters for system checks on carded version and AR flag, plus also to consider the exceptions mentioned before. Uh, apologize if some of this was a bit too uh, technical or too carrier in depth for some of the participants. Basically, the point we were trying to make is to say, um, yeah, this was not something trivial at all. So it was quite complex. And yeah, we hope we were able to, to implement something that will work from next month on, from 1st July on. Andre? Yes, so this is a slightly graphic overview between the two project setup we had to make it all happen that I mentioned before, maybe a little easier to, to overview here. So we had the airmail project on the right side and the ICS2 project on the left side. ICS2 project looked into coordination with the customs authorities, fully understanding the requirements design and implement a new or adapted process for cargo and also specify and implement necessary changes to ensure compliant ICS2 reporting for both cargo and airmail. Whereas the airmail IT project was more technical, they migrated the old application to the new airmail system, rolled out that system globally designed and implemented new and adapted airmail processes, for example, the scanners I already mentioned, and um, specified and implemented necessary changes to provide the ICS to relevant airmail data. And the point where they all meet is the integrated process design that we did at the very beginning to decide who has to do what and which system has to do what what data to provide it to whom and at what point in time so that at the end the result will be a compliant ICS2 reporting from carrier perspective. That means once again the pre-arrival F42 that we will have to submit for the airmail we transport to and via the European Union and of course Switzerland and Norway. Sorry for not mentioning that all the time. Yeah, next slide on there. Yes, so now we are at the end of May. So that's basically close to one month before the go live for us. We have done a lot and reached a lot of milestones. We have been involved in proactive communication and support for our customers, postal operators or so ML customers regarding carded performance as compliance and also regarding AR flag performance and compliance. We have um, informed regarding revised referrals for ICS uh, to both release one and two. So obviously mail has been doing preloading reporting since March 21. So during that time until now, also referrals might have been issued. And of course, we as a carrier would have to have been informed in order to be able to, let's say, hold a shipment in case of do not load. We also have been lobbying for the understanding that it is indeed carrier wish to, to have an assessment complete, um, meaning the AR flag to say a little more than filing has been done. 
Uh, it is a matter of understanding, I assume, because we as a carrier do bear a certain risk, but definitely from the moment uh, it is not a common understanding. So therefore, at least the AR flag to uh, confirm that filings have been done and at least there is no open referral or even a do not load uh, attached to any mail consignment that is handed over to us. We have been working closely with UPU and IPC regarding carded AR flag assessment complete uh, readiness monitoring and um, clarifying few details on both sides. Have been specifying building testing and the rolling out the new mail IT so that is complete on our side, as mentioned before. Uh, 100 plus scanning stations have been rolled out worldwide, so that is in use. Acceptance process has been changed. Uh, post layable process has been implemented. And also while doing all this, we also uh, took the chance to sort of clean up our, our own processes, separating the EDI mailboxes per group airline that all belong to the Lufthansa group and carry cargo so that now we have a, a very clean, um, let's say, messaging setup in place. Andre. Yes, so that said, even though a lot has been done, um, we still have a few uncertainties. Um, I, I actually think, um, I think it was stated before here that we are keen to start. Uh, definitely applies to us as well, I must say, because all planning is one thing and preparation, but I think, um, yeah, we have been part of enough rollouts and uh, even ICS1 years back. To, to know that only once we, we really start and get going, we will, we will have the actual learnings probably on all involved sides. So one point for us that, um, yeah, we are still looking for final clarification, revised referrals, how often would it actually happen? It has been stated before here that, yeah, the, the probability is not very high, but in theory it can happen. So we definitely need a process for that. Communication lines um, for that. And also how big is the risk for us as a carrier? The assessment complete versus AR flag, or rather what does the AR flag mean? Um, as long as it only means that reporting has been done, it is not an explicit okay, which we generally insist on for cargo before transporting anything. So therefore there is a risk on carrier side. The readiness of postal operators, definitely a concern. Um, carded availability and quality. Uh, I think Jan has uh, rightly presented some numbers. So definitely a lot of progress has been made. We have been seeing a really good development, but we are still not at the point we need to be. Also, I think both sides learned during uh, the, the past month where everybody has been looking at carded penetration that sending a carded alone is not enough. It needs to be the correct version. Uh, it definitely needs to have the AR flag with the pertaining information and also some other details have to be provided that might not be mandatory in the carded per se, but for this process related to ICS2 and for the carrier to be able to actually generate it into a postal airway bill, there are some things that are needed. Response times of the member states is of course also something that we will have to wait and see how it is. Um, yes, we hear it's quite immediate, but yeah, that, that is of course something that will affect uh, air, air cargo because why would anyone choose air cargo versus other means uh, that is for speed? So yeah, let's see how that works out in the end. Transit at the EU hubs, of course, there is a potential risk for our businesses because as said before, we have no way of avoiding the EU when flying anywhere. So yeah, 
pending solution and full clarity between all the parties that are discussing at the moment. Our transfer at non-EU stations, as said before, who is going to take care of what part of the process and the release to exceptions, how is letters, military mail, etc., handled because there is no explicit okay for those receptacles. It is rather the fact that they will not be reported. So how do we know when it is correct and valid that we're not expecting an AR flag anywhere? Whereas in another shipment um, consignment, sorry, we, we have to look for it. So in, in all these points, um, we have also closely um, cooperated with the, the bodies here. So definitely big thanks to IATA and UPU. Um, my colleague uh, responsible for airmail processes is a member in the airmail board and also very important, the IATA UPU contact committee where all parties involved uh, sit at the same table. So for me, it is quite clear, we can only really achieve the compliance if everyone works together. Carrier readiness is great, but that doesn't help at all if we don't receive the data that we need. So only all of us, I think, working together, pulling on the same strings can really make it work. Andre? So if you allow, I would like to close with an appeal actually from us as carrier to all uh, DPOs that might not be fully aware or ready. We definitely need the joint approach for our compliance and therefore keep the global postal flows moving. Um, if not already done, please join the initiative that Jan mentioned initially, um, yeah, where UPU will help to overview your carded penetration and um, quality. Be ready with your IT and your process. Carded 2.1 with all necessary data and of course the AR flag. And this uh, I think has slightly come up um, through questions for Renata's presentation earlier. So for us as a carrier, airmail reporting both destination EU and transiting EU is a regulatory requirement that we have to fulfill. Um, for us, that is not an option. So it's quite a given. Therefore, from what we are seeing now, it will look like not being able to comply with that. If we cannot fulfill our obligation to compliance means we will no longer be able to accept some consignments from the 1st of July onwards. Thank you very much. Really happy to see such a huge interest here in this topic. Thank you for joining. There is an email address mentioned here. So in case of any clarifications uh, with us as a carrier, please feel free to reach out. Thank you. Thank you, Rani. Uh, thank you very much for that. Uh, great presentation. Uh, still, of course, a few question marks that we will have to answer, but indeed we have the right players at the table. So uh, we'll certainly be able to provide some updates to everyone here uh, soonish, I would say. Um, just one thing I, I see here in the chat, uh, in the Q&A, there is one question, maybe very quickly. I know time is, is, is short here, but uh, they were asking if you could share briefly some insights into how ICS2 acceptance check is being done in stations where you use GHA scanners and so on. Do you have any, any uh, insights that you can share? Um, sure. Luckily, we were able to, uh, let's say, convince <laughs> most GHAs that it is, in fact, uh, easier and, uh, you know, will eliminate any manual process that they would have to do uh, to use our system with our scanners. Uh, for those where uh, that is not the fact, um, it, it is not 100% uh, clarified, to be honest, because, uh, yeah, I think that's where the question comes from. It will require some sort of a, let's call it manual check, 
um, somehow us informing the GHA what can be accepted and what cannot be accepted. Right. So definitely a, a sort of a manual workaround or out of the regular systems, at least uh, process that, that yeah. will have to be implemented. Yeah, some kind of an exception handling that you will have to put in place. Huh? Yeah. Okay, thanks. Thanks a lot for that. Uh, Jan, I saw your hand raised. I think I'm going to hand over to you again. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, I just wanted to really thanks to Rani for excellent presentation. I would like also to express my, my uh, uh, great appreciation for a very active uh, uh, approach uh, of Lufthansa. Uh, Lufthansa was the first carrier uh, who, uh, which piloted uh, full EAD global postal model with Brazil Post. And uh, we appreciate also conversion of uh, carded messages to cargo messages, as you mentioned, postal airway bill uh, equipment for your handling stations is ready. So uh, great thanks. And I hope that uh, we will continue in such cooperation. You are very active also in uh, improving our compliance reports. And, uh, and uh, we would like to encourage also other carriers, as you mentioned, Rani, to join this free of charge uh, reporting to let you know what, uh, what are the gaps in uh, carded messages received from, from post, when I'm talking about carriers, or from in, in your arrested messages, which you are sending to, to, uh, uh, to the post. So uh, I think that uh, it was excellent presentation and uh, I would like just to thanks a lot. Uh, but we have a problem with uh, time. We are running out of the time. Uh, so uh, uh, we do our best also to answer your questions uh, in the chat. Uh, we will continue in that. Uh, but uh, uh, now, if I may, uh, I'd like to continue with uh, another speaker. And I'd like to give a floor uh, to uh, Nermin Hassan from Egypt Post to share uh, uh, Egypt, uh, Egypt uh, view on ICS2 readiness and, and challenges. But if I may, Nermin, I would like to ask you, be short, please, and uh, give a floor for questions if needed, but uh, be short, please. Thank you. Uh, hello, Jan. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Then, Jan, I promise uh, it is a really short presentation. Um, next slide, please. Well, um, NPREF, uh, there is some requirements to enable origin designated operator to fulfill to the ICS2 uh, requirements. And uh, we try to brief the most important uh, factors that will affect uh, our abilities as uh, origin operator outside the EU. Um, next slide, please. Well, this is all, but uh, in sake of time, I will go start one by one uh, to mention them. Um, as you see here, the timing rules are extremely important uh, for our operation uh, to provide certainty and clarity on what shall be done. We have different scenarios here. Uh, we receive a referral or even without receiving a referral. At the very beginning, if assessment complete, it's not uh, clear now what the, uh, the destination operator will, uh, the customs will provide assessment complete or not. It is optional. It's not uh, guaranteed. So uh, a very important questions uh, in case of no received referrals. How long origin designated operator shall wait before assuming that there is no referrals to be sent and processing the mail as usual? Is it two hours? Is it four hours? Is it six hours? Because if, in case that we're not aware, it will be immediately sent the, uh, the messages and then we might receive uh, a referral. And this will cause a huge complications if the dispatch is already uh, given to uh, the carriers. So it's very important to set this timing rule to give us clarity. Another factor is very important, even much, much more important than the first scenario. What in case of uh, we received a request for information or screening, and then we provided the information and we didn't receive any assessment complete message or any, even another referral from the destination. How long we shall wait, 24 hours, 48 hours? This will put us in a very critical situation with our customers who will ask and track the, the shipment and will ask why the shipment is not moved. So we need to have a clarity on this and how to respond to our uh, customers. Also, as Renata said for her wonderful presentation, I'd like to thank her and Rani, it was very useful for us, that we make sure that there is no open referral. The timing is 
is, is fundamental to close the referral without prolonging the exportation process. So it's very important and crucial for everyone to be in clarity and certainty how to act. Next slide, please. The ICT requirements are already challenging, yet how we how it's going to be implemented is more challenging for us. All of us are aware that the EED requirements are intended mainly to supplement the traditional methods of screening. It's very important we know that it increases and enhances the security intelligence. However, uh, it's not all scenarios are critical as uh, equally. Uh, in case of the not load, it's very clear that the not load means that we stop the movement of this item and this item has, shall, it is extremely dangerous and we need to altogether move to stop this item and to check and secure it. But for the request of, of information and request uh, for additional information, uh, sorry, is issuance of uh, RFS, it's not RFS, it's RFI, sorry for this mistake. Um, such shall not be uh, frequently and uh, triggered for minor issues such as incorrect postcode or invalid email. Not all the, the countries are equally uh, technologically advanced or calitary uh, sophisticated that every citizen has an email. Even uh, if it is marketplace uh, data, it will be easily inserted the email in, in the shipping label. But if it is um, C2C mail, it's, not, it's very expected that the dot will be dash, for example. So this mistake can be done. So we don't expect uh, a referral for invalid uh, email or uh, incorrect postcode that will stop the mail. Of course, we will do our best to provide the accuracy, and there is a lot of efforts has been done to, uh, to, to guarantee the accuracy of data, but still the scenarios of some mistakes will be there. So we don't, we ask, actually, we urge the, uh, the, the, uh, the EU to consider to implement this in a very limited way, that if it is something critical here. Also, the request for a screening, it's according to ECAO uh, regulations and the, also the applicable national regulations for each country. Uh, is the, the, secu the screening is done by the security board, the, the, board, the board of security. So what is the additional screening where it will be done? It's already the equipment that uh, Egypt Post using of, of office exchange is already approved by the national regulations, uh, the, 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 the national authorities. And it is the border security who do the screening check. So what the additional screening will be and how it will be, this is uh, it's not a clear information for us. So this is very important also to be clarified. The lead referral actually for request for a screening is something a little bit uh, strange because if we expect a little referral, this means that uh, the mirror is accepted by uh, the airlines, inspected by the airlines, the ground handling and the security border in all different uh, stages, uh, dual view, x-ray, ETD, dog check, all this has been done. So actually it's a little bit strange that we expect requests for screening when the items is already um, uh, provided for, uh, is already accepted by uh, the air uh, carrier. So also this has to be defined, well defined, what is the cases and what shall be done. And also the alerts, uh, system, uh, this will be in, in the next slide. Next slide, please. Um, uh, also, we need to know, uh, to develop a technology system that will trigger the alerts for everyone. One of the challenges as well is the mapping. Um, as uh, Rani said, uh, for the master airway pill, it's one card, one receptacle, one master airway pill. Actually, it's not the same for the request for information uh, between the UPU standard and the, the EC. As you can see here, it's multiple codes uh, mapped to uh, one code. Uh, this is very crucial because the use of free text is very complicated. We need to um, uh, define a very good scope of using uh, the code instead of the free text because the free text will, might be the system not uh, transmitted in correct and accurate way. It could be like symbols not uh, seen for uh, not clear, and even maybe the text is not clear, or whatever the, the complexity. You know, all of us are aware of how free text can be difficult uh, to be transmitted successfully uh, among the, the stakeholders. So the use of code is very important, and it is very confusing for the average operation staff who will receive A20, for example, amend container address. 
what is the part of the address. As you can see, the UPU code list is already one by one and well identified. So it's A21. It will be clear that the postal address street or premise is required. So the, specific, the specified code list is very important. So we need to consider better mapping for this. There's also another fact that uh, per the EC, there is amendments of data. Actually, we cannot amend the data. Bear, based on our operation and uh, our regulations, we provide the data, but we don't amend. So of course, how we can expect like amend the consumer name and what principle it would be, we ask someone if he's saying that my name is, you know, John, George Joseph, for example, or uh, Muhammad Ali, that you need to amend your name. Actually, this um, is not clear uh, for us as well. Next slide, please. Uh, here, the uh, developing alert system is very important uh, because until this moment, uh, uh, what we have managed to do in our in-house system is to set the rules to prevent the movement of the item from a uh, step to another if uh, we received a, a referral for this item. Until this moment, we cannot test, uh, do not load scenario. Uh, we have developed alert system by email uh, to trigger uh, for uh, the carrier for each post operation. But until this moment, we, we couldn't uh, test this scenario. Um, it is very required that alert system will be developed uh, by uh, the BTC. I know that uh, there's progress happening on this uh, aspect, but this is very important. So we have alert system which efficient, well informed that there is a referral received, especially if it is do not load and especially if it is, uh, uh, the mail is uh, transported to uh, the air carrier. Also, a completed test protocol uh, uh, that can be implemented by all stakeholders. Uh, Jan and Andre are aware, and maybe majority of, uh, of the attendees are aware that the number of postal operators who are engaged in the referral messages, messages are not big. Uh, we need a gradual approach to do uh, the ICS2 implementation. We need to have a complete test protocol that is practical and pragmatic and everyone can implement, not only the advanced Europe can implement. This is very important that uh, the capacities of member countries um, are considered. We are not saying we will not do it. We, we, we are doing a lot of efforts to do it, but uh, we need to have a clarity and certainty for end-to-end -end operation in all scenarios, in all cases. It's to be clear for everyone what to do and how to do and the proper action so that everyone can be in compliance to the requirements. Also, the balanced UPU uh, regulations, it's very important. Um, right now, all the proposed amendments to the UPU regulations are only for the destination uh, countries. None of them address the need of, uh, of the origin. So I believe there's some certain commitments on the destination, for example, to respond to uh, within certain times to the origin country reference response. If it is assessment complete, if it is required more information, not just leave them without uh, any uh, responses. Also to define the scope of what the referral that has to stop the movement of the mail. Of course, we will do our best to provide the information, but what kind of information is required? This one has to stop the mail. Also, this has to be uh, well defined clearly in the regulations of the EPU. And finally, here the freedom of transit and single postal territory shall, shall be maintained as well because the postal operator are the provider of universal service obligations, and we are a big chance for SMEs to export their items in economic way. Not all the SMEs can build the capacity or technology to provide all this. So it will be on the operator who do this on their behalf. So we are a big chance for SMEs and big majority of citizens in developing countries to reach the international markets and to generate revenue for them. Um, so in line with the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, we giving them a chance to achieve no poverty and decent work for them. So universal service obligations are important and post office is important to provide this. So there is consideration shall be given uh, to uh, the post office capacity to enable these people and to maintain their capacity to do so. Next slide, please. So uh, what we need to ensure success is, is the joint and gradual implementation with consideration of the capacity of all uh, member countries. 
uh, it is well also understood that data analytics combined with traditional methods of screening uh, enhance security intelligence. Uh, so um, the data along with uh, physical checks and physical controls are the one who secure, but not only the data alone. So we 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 expect that the, the X-ray and the ETD and double check will discover the explosive will, will discover the drugs the, dr the drugs and related items. Not only the data alone. That's why um, we understand that data are used to combat the crimes, to uh, arrest the criminals, to try to put something illegal in this parcel. But uh, we don't expect the data itself to secure the mail. So. We need to have this consideration and we need to make sure that the referral shall be limited to suspected person and suspected content, not just be triggered by some AI uh, intelligence system will say this postcode is not correct. So trigger a request for information for this 500 items that have wrong postcode. Actually, we, 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 we urge that this, this is not the case. It will be uh, limited for suspected persons and suspected content. This is very important to be done, at least at the beginning, when the member countries have the capacity to provide 100% accurate data with minor issue, I believe uh, this is fundamental to ensure success for everyone. Uh, also, continue, uh, the, the continuing uh, piloting uh, the global most, uh, uh, postal model uh, for referrals and referral response with different member countries and more engagement uh, among uh, the customs authority and the postal operators and the air carriers to make sure that we reach um, uh, protocols that can be implemented by everyone. And here I can reach, I reach the end of my presentation. Thank you very much, uh, Nermin, for your excellent presentation. And I appreciate also that you were really short as you promised. Uh, so, uh, uh, I do not see a uh, raised hand. Maybe, Andre, do, do you see some, some raised hand? I do not see any raised hand. Uh, so for the moment, I believe we could continue. Thank you. So uh, it oh, was- uh, I, Sorry, sorry, sorry. Billy Roach has a hand raised. Sorry, Billy, quick question. Billy Roach, Thanks, American Andrew. Airlines. Yes. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, we can. Hey, I just wanted to thank the presenters so far. This has been an outstanding, um, an ex outstanding meeting. I, I, I've heard from a couple of people so far that we should have extended even longer. So get back at it, guys. But really, really great work. Appreciate everybody's just exceptional work here. That's all I have, Andre. Thank you very much, Billy, uh, uh, for your nice words and really uh, excellent speakers. Uh, I'd like just to add that uh, uh, Nermin mentioned that we need to continue in our piloting. I would really uh, encourage all carriers and posts um, uh, start piloting as soon as possible to find the gaps, uh, improve uh, before 1st of July. Do not wait for the deadline. And uh, if you need any contacts, you can contact me. I can provide uh, postal contacts or Andre on the on carrier side. We really would appreciate as many pilots as possible. Uh, I would like to give a floor now to um, to another speaker. Uh, I think that Christina from uh, uh, Christina Cuerda, uh, Alba de uh, Alba. Ladeo uh, from uh, from uh, Spain uh, will present uh, uh, the view on ICS2 from EU designated operator. So, uh, uh, Christina, floor is yours, and the same, please uh, be short, please. Thank you. Thank you, Jan, for giving me the floor. Good morning, good afternoon, uh, good night, wherever you are. My name is Cristina Cuerda from Castle Manager. I'm EAD Manager at Correos, a Spanish uh, postal operator. Um, yes, um, I have to, to, to share the, the point of view of um, EU Post uh, from the perspective of ICS2 from the EU Post. I will try to go quickly. And maybe uh, go get to the point to the last part of uh, the presentation. Uh, I will try to 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 show what um, some some few uh, some things about timeline system and liability, but uh, take into account my colleague has uh, 
in presenting these uh, points, I will uh, try to go quick. Um, in, this, in this slides, uh, you can find um, the global postal model. I will uh, also um, ask if uh, you think that this is uh, the full uh, process of EDE. In my opinion, um, it doesn't show at all uh, the process according to the reality because uh, we can see here the, the transit and transitment issues and we have uh, seen in the previous uh, presenter that uh, both are a, a very challenging situation for, for us. Just to take into account the 19, there is 19, 29 uh, countries uh, to be had to, to deal to, with uh, this uh, new um, ICS to release two requirements. Um, all of these um, are from Europe, but also Nor uh, Norway and uh, Switzerland are included uh, here. And the dates of the implementation uh, um, is different for, for us. In, in blue, the, the countries uh, the signature operator will start in uh, uh, July, and then the rest of us will start in 2nd October. Um, we have to remind uh, there are three um, important milestones. Uh, we have started in 2021 and uh, are directly linked to the current status to the um, release two for us, for EU post. We have to um, deal with the previous uh, pending issues from this uh, uh, important impl regulation implemented in 2021. And uh, before um, we look into the 23 uh, new challenges or new uh, requirements, for us, for EU boss, um, we have to um, provide to ICA2 a new uh, F43 uh, message, new message, uh, based on the new IT map provided by no EU post, uh, this includes uh, or should be include the SS code uh, type of person and theory, and also uh, the um, 44 uh, based on the previous measures. The same info for transit and uh, scenarios. Uh, I will not uh, keep in uh, in, uh, in in details um, as. Suppose uh, we want to meet uh, with the UP regulation, we want to meet to ICH2 regulation. We want to do our uh, homeworks, uh, but we can't uh, do it alone. In order um, um, to have a look or to review the what is or what are the prerequisites uh, that we need to, to meet the new uh, challenges for from October 2nd, uh, just quickly uh, review the data selling agreement uh, according the um, DGPR regulation, but there is not in place nothing uh, regarding data selling agreement uh, for transit uh, scenarios. Tennis barcode, data capture tools, and it's very important that Origin Post uh, have implementing the last version of CDAs or IPAs uh, to ensure the compliance uh, with ICF. Uh, too, because if you don't have uh, these uh, last versions, you will, uh, will not um, manage uh, the referrals or, or the EDA check uh, before to nest in the items uh, before to load to the air company, etc. Uh, yes, um, to remind that uh, uh, EU posts are sending posts. Um, we will not send ITMAT previous and card it with, with air flags to other EU proxy destination. I think may, sometimes this is obvious, but um, just in case, please, uh, all uh, presenters have to be taken into account. Same but different. And this is only to show that there is a lot of um, stakeholders involved. There is um, different regulations governed by different international entities. 
there is um, different IT provider, there is different measures, different uh, systems involved in origin country, in EU country, and different network. In, in the last, uh, in Europe, more or less, um, 26 countries use, uh, use IPC as a, our IT provider to uh, present the security declaration of, to ICS2. In the origin countries, more of uh, them use the all um, IT tools and uh, solutions uh, from PTC, from uh, I IPS. But also in Europe, there is three countries uh, that uh, use a DOC systems. This is just to, to show what is the complexity for us uh, because all these stakeholders have different challenges connected to each other. In addition, in Europe, we have to take into account that we need the reference of the ENS um, from ICS2 declarations, security and safety declaration. Uh, we need it to continue with uh, the follow uh, import customs and taxation process. Both are linked and uh, you can have get the idea of the complexity of this procedure and uh, why the lack of uh, poor quality of uh, item has a strong impact um, on the import process um, for, for us for EU post. Quickly, quickly. <laughs> okay. In this slide, um, you can see what uh, will change uh, with uh, release uh, two for and what is the status uh, for us, for your post. Yes, uh, regarding the uh, data elements, we have to provide these new measures um, provided by um, our colleagues uh, from no EU post. And uh, the reality is that they have uh, difficulties uh, to provide the HS code uh, by no EU post. Um, and also it's uh, important to take into account that this is not or will not be mandatory until 2025 by EU regulations. There is no technical solution ad hoc in place to identify the type of person nor indication in the ITMAT. The ITMAT, the current ITMAT does not include any field to provide this information of what is B, uh, who is B, who is uh, C. And we have uh, to challenge uh, with this issue in, uh, when I write or before I write the, the, the item. Of course, the import, um, for, to proceed with the import customs clearance in, in Europe, we need uh, this new uh, ITMAT, these new uh, measures based in the new ITMAT, and for transits, um, the new F43 based on the copy of the new item act, including uh, new elements and the copy of credits provided by no EU post to EU post um, in transit. And uh, has, uh, it has already explained that there is no technical solution nor legal requirements in, in place uh, from, uh, until now. And uh, transit mean just to remind that uh, EU posts are not involved in uh, in this process, but uh, there is a lot of challenges too, for especially for uh, origin and uh, air companies. What about these challenges for EU ports? Uh, we have three blocks of challenges, legal, uh, operational, and technical issues. Um, in general, from the point of view of legal issues, um, there is no alignment between the EU and uh, EU PU regulations in terms of new requirements, uh, data elements, um, let me explain in the, the points uh, with the mapping uh, of the some codes. And neither uh, regarding uh, the dates of implementations. Um, some of the new requirements for ICS2 release two has been uh, endorsed in uh, by UPU regulation in the last uh, meetings of the uh, POC at UPU but will be enforced only uh, in 2025. However, uh, 
the new requirements for us uh, will in place uh, will be enforced from uh, 2023, next second uh, October. And the question is um, how we have to deal uh, with the, the items, uh, with the, 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 the information, the data uh, between 2023 and 2020. Um, five. We have seen that uh, Renata explaining what is clearly the direct challenge for, for, for us, for you both. And we have uh, in the middle of a very complex and challenging uh, scenario. Um, I think it's important to know that uh, uh, there is not a UPU mechanism are in place to penalize or impose or penalize to destination. Uh, as we see, uh, it's that no sense, of course. Uh, but uh, there is um, not uh, support. We don't have support to um, to return items to uh, to penalize uh, for non-compliance on of EAD. Um, next, um, from the point of view of the operational. Um, the sum up is the, the gaps between uh, capabilities and uh, ICS2 release two requirements we have already seen. There is a still a uh, pending issues to solve from the release one uh, related to the lack and the poor quality and the referrals testing is ongoing. We are very happy uh, testing with um, Brazil Post and also uh, Spanish Customs are involved in the testing of the, this uh, UPU standard reference. And also, uh, of course, with the support of the PTC and IPC, uh, we are uh, in testing too with other countries. Hong Kong Post is also involved in, uh, in this uh, kind of um, reference testing. But the challenge is also is how to operationally uh, cope with the items surviving without ENS and the open reference. More, uh, I, I will I will not read it. And also uh, for us, for EU post, uh, we have to adapt the inbound process for release two requirements linked with uh, or, uh, the the previous or, or the later uh, customs VAT process. Challenges from the point of view of connectivity issues um, is the connectivity issues among the all. Uh, IT stakeholders. stakeholders. Um, IPC, as our IT provider for ACS, uh, too, is working on enforcing sorry, uh, the currency, uh, the current challenges from the release one uh, timeline issues, no data available, incomplete data, like postcode. But we will think that this kind of uh, challenges will increase uh, with the release uh, two because, um, for example, missing new data element like. Uh, HS code. Um, I will um, well, I, I will pass to to the next one. Uh, this is the um, the impact for for EU post uh, from the um, EU legal point of view. EU post has the obligation to meet with EU regulations and to provide the new requirements for ICS two for release two from October 2nd. The previous challenge uh, we have already seen uh, will be translated uh, in, uh, in, in some impact. The, there is some uh, example for, for us. Um, we have to invest a lot of money in IT solution to meet uh, the new requirements. We are pending or we are dealing also with the previous loss of volumes business from after the pandemic. Uh, and um, we will see what will happen, but uh, we think that uh, this uh, new uh, situation will impact also in business. Non-EU post, uh, non post could decide to avoid the EU as country of uh, transit. What happened with the sanctions? Um, this uh, kind of sanctions uh, for non-compliance uh, is set in uh, at national level. We will not, uh, we will know uh, know what will happen. Some countries will apply penalties. Some countries will not apply. I don't know what is the, the, the expectation about that. 
And um, in, in any case, um, data capture upon arrival, handling, uh, treatment uh, manually of the equipment, button, bottlenecks in operations, and delays in delivery, to the result is bad customers, uh, bad uh, customer experience. In any case, all this uh, impact for EU uh, imply extra cost uh, for EU -post. A realistic approach and gradual implementation are required. And EU post is uh, fully depend on no EU post uh, readiness uh, to meet the uh, new um, regulations. Uh, how about the expectations? Expectations, um, this is like, um, <laughs> like a letter to Santa Claus, I think. Uh, okay, uh, we expect from the senders customer, I think it's very important and they are the responsible of, uh, for the customer declaration and they, say, and they should be well informed by the origin post about the, the requirements for goods uh, to plug the destination and what will be the consequences of not providing a good and uh, accurate uh, data. Take into account that EU uh, destination post has not contact with the sender in the origin country. Uh, from the uh, our colleagues from uh, uh, postal operator, uh, as usual, the cooperation to improve data quality and uh, quantity and new data requested for the new release, if possible. Um, the implementing uh, the UPU standards to be able to receive an ACA upon the reference. Please reply reference is very important. You reply reference in order to provide the air, air flag to the, to the uh, air carrier. Checking uh, the readiness of the items is very, very important. Uh, if you don't uh, count uh, with the last version, you will not meet the, the, the new requirements. Please contact with uh, PTC or EPU or your own uh, IT colleagues in your post. It, it's very important to, to be ready in this uh, aspect. Regarding airlines, um, of course, readiness to, re to receive a credit um, and um, also uh, take into account the plastic destination has no relationship with the airlines. Uh, this is a responsibility of origin uh, country and uh, comply also with the security regulation and maintain flexibility and come in, in, in areas of the common uh, understanding. IT providers, cooperation amongst all IT providers to implement the new technical infrastructures uh, to meet uh, really two and to provide to us and no use uh, at carriers also with a solution to implement the new requirements. For us, please, um, uh, from now until 2nd October, we will uh, expect to, to have some solutions on this aspect. UPU and European uh, Commission expectations solve the policy regulations to, to find a common understanding. A realistic approach is uh, required. EU post as a universal postal service provider and facilitator of the trade and also business and consumers into the EU and globally will be impacted. National custom authorities, please consider flexibility and cooperation for common benefit and increase the coordination on regulation, operational and technical aspects inside at national level, but also related with uh, the international environment. And that is all <laughs> from my side. Um, from, I hope that, um, no, not to be in very quickly, but in any case, uh, you will uh, have the, the the presentation. And if case on any doubt, please contact me. Thank you. Thank you very much, Christina, for your excellent presentation. I think that uh, it was clear. I again must uh, thanks to uh, you. I, I mean, uh, Korea Post uh, for very active approach. Uh, as you mentioned, you were together with Brazil Post and Lufthansa first uh, uh, implementing full EAD global postal model for all uh, eight uh, flows. Uh, 
we appreciate your support. Uh, uh, I agree with challenges mentioned uh, in previous presentation by Nermin on in your presentation. We really need more time uh, to, to analyze all different scenarios, uh, face these challenges. And that's the reason why you mentioned many times, I mentioned also uh, pragmatic implementation approach. Uh, and uh, we expect also support from carriers uh, and member states, uh, because you mentioned penalty system. You are right. It could be different country by country, different uh, uh, system, uh, different policy. So uh, 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 that's the reason why we need to continue in, in, in piloting and, and uh, uh, to avoid uh, strict decision uh, uh, on 1st of July or 2nd of uh, October. Uh, when you are talking, you were talking about some challenges. You mentioned, for example, uh, uh, postal codes. Uh, there are some challenges with ages codes. Uh, and uh, I'd like just to make a bridge between your presentation and next presentation because we have uh, IT providers which really helped us. I must appreciate uh, IPC support, PTC support to provide solution uh, either for uh, designated operators or for, for carriers. They will shortly present them now. Uh, and uh, I'd like to give a floor uh, to uh, first to the IPC, to Jorgen van Mok, uh, uh, and uh, mm, uh, ask him uh, to present shortly uh, some solutions prepared by IPC uh, for carriers and post, and it will be followed by, later by a presentation from PTC about their solution. So, uh, Jürgen, floor is yours. Uh, Odd, please stop sharing, and uh, as I understood, Jürgen, you will share your slide directly. Yes, correct. Thanks. So I need to share screen, I assume, or is it this, yeah? Not yet. Yeah, it's coming. Do Good. you see, your slide. Yeah, do yes. you see it? <laughs> yes. Go All ahead. right. OK, so yes, um, IPC is um, working on uh, a few solution modules. Um, it was because uh, the post uh, in IPC were very concerned with the readiness overall of the industry, and, um, and we were very um, uh, convinced that a large group of carriers, and we saw earlier today Lufthansa being very ready, uh, uh, would be ready, but we we're also concerned that there might be um, a lot of carriers that do carry mail into the EU would be less ready or not ready on time or not ready at all. Uh, and so uh, to mitigate the risk of mail not being able to be flown into the EU uh, or, or that mail that it would impact mail flows, uh, post uh, of IPC have decided to fund solutions that would be made available as a plan B, a minimum viable solution for air carriers just to be able to be compliant. And that's what uh, this is about. So, uh, the first uh, module we have uh, developed is that uh, to support the validation for acceptance, which was mentioned earlier. That's basically when the carrier takes possession, that by scanning receptacles, they can um, validate if that receptacle is part of a consignment for which an AR flag was provided. Um, and uh, it is uh, uh, three ways that we have uh, this solution uh, um, made available. One is an API integration option directly with a, an existing system that does scanning uh, to check uh, in our uh, database where we process cards if this was part of a card with an AR flag or an EAD tool, which is more a reporting tool where this can be done or uh, through a mobile uh, web app scanner. Um, IPC, uh, furthermore, is also providing um, a solution for the actual ENS filing uh, and uh, also through either an uh, API or through the EAD tool. And uh, if those solutions are provide, uh, used by carriers, we also will um, uh, use those events generated, so either for validation or for filing, to create rested messages so that posts working with the airlines have some benefit from it as well in getting more visibility. Uh, so the focus now on deploying by the end of uh, June is uh, the so-called CAVA, so the Validation for Acceptance Solution. 
As I said, it's in the shape of an API integration option. Uh, it is uh, also available as mobile web app or in the form of an EAD uh, reporting tool. And I will show you shortly uh, an example. Uh, the, the filing uh, solutions are either by EA API integration or through a uh, what we call EAD2, which is a reporting tool uh, uh, which has all the data and can be displayed to the user that has access. So um, in the process of where uh, the post sends um, a card it, uh, as IPC, we receive um, uh, the, the card itself or the network that we operated uh, uh, for the EDI message exchange. And so the option that we're uh, having is one is an API integration that uh, if the carrier were to integrate this with their existing system, whatever system or a ground handle system where it's operated, it will uh, be set up such that if a scan is done, a receptacle ID is, um, uh, is, uh, can trigger an API call and there will be an immediate reply as to whether for that receptacle, the existence of an AR flag in card is true or false. And that uh, will then allow the carrier to uh, use that information to take the decision whether to accept or not accept. Uh, so the API call is where the carrier wants to use their own system completely, but they can use IPC as a reference for data and through an API link that gives immediate feedback. However, we will also provide, uh, have ready an uh, an app that, uh, or a web app that is uh, running on a mobile scanning device. Any Android mobile scanning device can be used for that. And uh, that will uh, basically uh, 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 be opened. And then when you scan the receptacles, you will get an immediate feedback if there is an AR flag uh, or not uh, for this uh, particular receptacle. So it's at receptacle scan level that this can be uh, activated so that uh, the carrier does, uh, that uses this at auto stations where they want, where they don't have their own scanners. Uh, you can, as carrier, opt to use this solution and uh, uh, IPC will be gladly uh, provide you this uh, and uh, as mentioned earlier, this is funded by POST, so such solutions are uh, available free of charge. So even carriers that already for most of their stations, but may have some gaps on some auto stations where they wish to accept mail, they can opt for this solution and IPC can provide that you can still scan your receptacles for acceptance and know whether they're okay or not. Alternatively, um, the uh, there is this EAD tool, as I said, it's a reporting tool that will list for each of the receptacles that you select either for, for a particular consignment or receptacle level and will give you whether the AR flag was there or not. And that is like a, uh, a reporting, uh, you will as a carrier get access to your data, of course, and then when uh, you enter either a consignment ID or receptacle, you will receive that information. Uh, so the other one is the actual uh, uh, F42 filing. So in the process, in this case, uh, the process with a handler that has just completed the load plan and is completing a manifest uh, information, uh, either there's the option of an API integration, whereby uh, the API call that will be triggered will pull uh, necessary data from the manifest and uh, will um, uh, be completed with uh, carded data so that then it can trigger the actual request for filing where IPC will convert all that data into F42 and do the F42 filing on behalf of the carrier. Um, or uh, again, the EAD tool can be used whereby the carrier can uh, use an entry screen uh, uh, where uh, the carded data will be pre-populated and where uh, the necessary additional data can be, can be added. Uh, so that is uh, uh, those two solutions. So uh, filing solution as validation solution are, uh, are available. And we are contacting different carriers that have approached us in allowing them to do the testing and uh, and trying it out. Uh, so if uh, any carrier that's interested can contact IPC and we will uh, follow up with you and in, in to assess the different needs you have to be ready with ICS2 release too. So there's, as we heard earlier, not, and we saw in Jan's presentation that out of the 100 uh, 
uh, AD carriers with sending card 89 or using the AR flag. In case as a carrier work with posts that are not ready or cannot be ready on time to provide an AR flag in carded, IPC will provide an additional solution uh, that is um, going to check um, uh, in the, and that's through the, AA, the EAD tool, if um, the receptacles included in carded contain items that are um, uh, have a, uh, are either where the uh, AAD is not applicable, uh, for example, documents or where there's uh, an assessment complete and provide a true or false. So um, in that case, um, uh, consignment is chosen and for the consignment, the receptacles are listed, uh, the AR flag indicator is provided. Uh, and if the uh, in the if the AR flag indicator is provided, there's no further data, then it's okay. If the AR flag is not provided, a check is done at the receptacle level. If for all the items in the receptacle, the status is true in terms of assessment complete on exempt, or if it's false, and so that will still allow, um, be it in a more manual way, uh, to uh, have the data available to uh, as. And then it's a business decision, of course, between the post and the carrier. The post would need to authorize us to, to, to display this information, and then the, it can be provided as access to a carrier uh, if the carrier is willing to use this process to accept mail where there is no AR flag. So it's just an alternative. Either there's no mail flow, or you can still have the necessary data uh, to uh, take a business decision on whether to accept or not. And the post would then be provided with in case a particular status is read for a receptacle to assess why it's read by seeing the list of items that are in the receptacle and see why some are not assessment to complete or exempt. And uh, for example, where the filing failed or where there was an outstanding RFI. And that way uh, the post can uh, resolve that and improve the status of uh, of that receptacle by making sure all items in the receptacles are good to go. So uh, in terms of the um, a filing solution, as I said, it is by, if you select a particular postal consignment ID, it will already pre-fill the card data. And then uh, there's an uh, option to fill out all the remaining data and uh, then an option to file, either to trigger with IPC, if you authorize IPC to do the actual filing that can be done. If not, uh, uh, we can return uh, the, the data so you can use your own filing method. Uh, if you have the postal airway bill uh, and you want to manually enter, that can be done. If you want to have airway bill numbers pre-populated, you can provide IPC with a range and we do the airway bill number range management and include the airway bill automatically in the pre-filled file uh, so that the rest of the data can be uh, included from the manifest. Uh, the, the few remaining data that are not coming from CARDI, that's not the postal area bill and there are not reference data, can then be completed and the filing can then be done. Uh, and as said earlier, if the filing is done and you click send, that send can either mean that you uh, have authorized IPC to do the filing, or you can also request a push via webhook to your own application so that you, uh, in case where you want to use the F42, but you do not want IPC to file it, you have another provider that will file it for you that can also be arranged. So the status where we are is that um, we are, sorry, currently in uh, UAT uh, for the applications. Uh, so carriers can contact us, can do testing with us. We will deploy at the end of June. Uh, with, uh, with the hard deadline the co coordination, of course, with those carriers that have contacted us and want to use the service. And as for the resident uh, um, provision on the basis of the use of these applications that we will start soonest after the um, CAVA and uh, CAFE, so the filing and the validation solutions have been uh, deployed. Um, so yeah, these are the next steps and uh, I know time is running, so I won't go to uh, the details. I've mentioned those. We are currently in UAT. You can contact us. We will support you. And um, yeah, we will be ready by the end of June. That was it from uh, IPC. Mm -hmm.
Thank you very much, Jorgen. I think that I see some uh, raised hands now, but if I may, I'd like to finish this uh, this session uh, focused on IT tools. Give a floor now to uh, David Ausek from Postal Technology Center, and then we will uh, give a floor uh, for some uh, questions. Thank you. Uh, and uh, David, floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Jan, and good afternoon, everyone. Uh, so I will try to be brief. Um, we can go in, yeah, immediately to the next slide. Next again, please. This is just the agenda. Um, I always start with uh, the global postal model, just to recall uh, where our application can be used. Uh, so the main one, ITS, CDS. You've seen this slide before, but that's still important to recall it because um, those software are still the foundation of, uh, of the technology range that we provide for, for ICS2. And you will see that the rest of the presentation, when we talk about uh, APIs or about notification, um, it, those, no, those notifications, those APIs can be used by everyone, even the non-IPS and CDS users. But if you are using IPS and CDS, and most of you are, uh, they are totally integrated. So, you, so you, have, you have nothing specific to do. Uh, we can go to the next, please, um, where I'm presenting uh, what how the, the AR uh, flag works with the uh, with the IPS, particularly in conjunction with uh, the the AED check API. Um, so at the bottom of the slide, you have uh, you have some screenshot about the configuration. Uh, in the IPS, how to configure your, your AR flag. Um, we have realized with experience, it's a little bit complex. Uh, so we, we have uh, developed a user guide uh, to help you with this configuration. It, it's a fact, we cannot do everything for you here uh, because every situation is different. So we can provide guidelines uh, to do the proper configuration in, in IPS. Uh, but but we cannot take all the decisions uh, for for every post and for every situation. So those guidelines uh, should help. Uh, if you don't have them, please contact the PTC support to receive them. Um, but uh, otherwise, even for for the dot post countries where we host for you, uh, you have to do the configuration uh, yourself. Uh, but when this is done, and that's what you have uh, on the top right of, uh, of the slide, uh, this is an illustration of uh, the workflow. How does it work when you prepare your card? It? Uh, so basically, if the AD check API is, uh, is green, does not return any alerts, so the process continues, there's nothing too specific to say and to do here. Uh, if there is an alert, uh, that's the second branch in, in a range. Um, here again, the ED check API cannot automate everything. At the end of the day, it will be um, it will be a decision by the post uh, what to do with the with the item. Uh, and here we have two scenarios: either you you have to take action and you are taking action to either remove the mail item uh, from the receptacle. Or if that is the case, to answer on the RFS or, or the RFI. Um, or, and that's the second branch, uh, there, there's no specific action to do because you determine that for the specific destination, because here we are not talking about only ICS2, but you may have some situation where the itemat uh, is, is, uh, is not required with this destination, for example, intra Europe. Um, or the item is only uh, containing documents, and in that case, uh, you will simply ignore the alert and, and continue uh, your, your normal process for, for the item. Next slide, uh, please. It's uh, also something that some of you may know. It's what the EAD check API uh, will return. Uh, first, it can be called either with an S10 uh, or with the S9, so the receptacle identifier. We will see why in the next uh, slide it's important to have uh, both. Um, for the CDS user, the call finish in the CDS. Um, and for the non-CDS users, it will go all the way to the to the QCS big data, so the central uh, 
repository of data at the, at the UPU. And what the API returns, uh, it's every item that does not have an IT mat, for example, uh, or that may have an IT mat, but uh, the most critical scenario as we see the do not load. Um, it will check if there's any kind of uh, RFS on RFI that has not been answered. Um, and uh, in the case of Europe, it will check that uh, the assessment complete is, is there. Uh, if no information at all is, is found about the, the, the itemat, it's also an alert. So it, the API will also return a non-compliance. Next slide, please. On this slide, we wanted to illustrate when and who uh, can call the ED check API. So first, the post, of course, at any point in, in the outbound process or inbound process that is also not to be presented here, but if necessary, it can be called in inbound, uh, but mostly, of course, for, for outbound. Uh, and again, until very, very late uh, in your process, so that's why when you are already at the stage of consigning the mail uh, and you're sending the precon and the card it, uh, it, it could make sense to, to call the API with the S9. And in that case, the, the API will check uh, all the items that are that are in the um, in the receptacles and, and return the status for the for the receptacle in totality. The carriers can also uh, access this uh, this API. Um, and, and we are thinking more and more to have a separate instance of the API that will, uh, for the carrier, simply uh, return if there's a do not load, because that's the most critical for you, uh, is, uh, is to know if there's anything that should not be uh, boarded on, on, on an aircraft. Next slide. Yes, thank you. Uh, so that's a summary of, of the solutions that we have. Um, most of them, of course, integrated. Again, if you're using IPS, CDS, uh, all those API that I'm talking about are, are included in it. Uh, there are still some of uh, the solutions that are under development. Uh, we have prepared an ICS to converter and we are ready to activate it if there's a need for it. Uh, we continue to enrich uh, the number of reports, particularly for uh, transport, uh, for airlines. Uh, the dashboards that are used also internally uh, to measure the compliance of every post, uh, you can use them directly, of course, uh, and, and you will have access uh, to a specific dash dashboard to monitor the ICS2 conversion and, and the AD check uh, calls that you're making. Um, and the last one, uh, which I also detail in the last in the last slide, is the notification mechanism uh, that we are putting in place. Because all those APIs that uh, I presented, they are still in, let's say, pull mode. It means you have to call uh, to receive uh, the the information and to to check uh, the latest information on a specific item. Um, but we also want to implement push notification. Uh, it has been alluded, I think, in the presentation of, from Nermin, from a, from a JIT post. Uh, so we will implement some push notification, uh, and that's what you have on the last uh, slide, uh, including uh, the solutions we have for the, for the carriers. Uh, so that will complement our offer, uh, particularly for the carriers to receive uh, any uh, alert uh, in case of late referral uh, or again, uh, do not load. Uh, we will complement this push notification mechanism with an application uh, for mobile uh, that again can be used for calling the EED check, uh, check the notification and which receive automatically the notifications um, and, and basically yes, simplify your process uh, of integrating with the with the UPU technologies. So that's what I have today. Thank you very much. I'm ready for questions if there's any question. Thank you, Jan. Thank you very much, uh, David, for your presentation. And now I, I'd like to open the floor for uh, questions regarding the presentation made by Jorgen or by David. Uh, so 
I see raised hands from Aaron uh, and Susan for a long time, so I don't know whether it's related to this topic, but uh, Aaron, floor is yours. No, so uh, no more. So Susanna, Susan, floor is yours. You are muted. You are muted. No response. No, no response. Okay. Okay. So I see no more raised hands. Uh, uh, we did our best to answer most of your questions uh, in the chat. Uh, uh, as uh, was proposed, we will copy uh, all questions and answers and uh, uh, we'll provide you a link uh, after the webinar, and uh, I hope it will help. Uh, maybe some additional questions. Of course, we are open to receive your questions also after the webinar, and uh, uh, we'll provide a feedback. I don't know, maybe now is the time, uh, Andre, when I'd like to ask you to maybe uh, provide short summary of the of today's webinar, which was a little bit longer, but very, uh, very interesting. And I think a lot of uh, new information. And I, I hope that really it helped to uh, to all participants. But please, some kind of summary from your side, Andre. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Jan. And uh, again, first of all, uh, a big thank you to uh, the UPU for organizing the, the webinar. It's extremely important that we have those webinars uh, regularly. It's important that uh, uh, you participants follow up uh, on the various initiatives uh, because that, that's where actually the discussions are happening. So should you have any question, I mean, these are uh, great uh, platforms to, to ask questions. But again, as you can see, we, we try our best to uh, uh, answer all of those. Uh, should you have additional questions, please reach out uh, to us, to Jan, to myself, uh, or even to some of the presenters. I'm pretty sure that they would be uh, more than happy to share. Uh, now, just as a very, very short summary, I'm not going to go into too many details, but uh, um, uh, definitely we see uh, readiness happening. I, I want to be positive about that. I know that there is still a lot to do, but readiness is is happening. I mean, again, when Jan showed at the very beginning the the numbers of uh, uh, DOs capable of sending its mat in two years, uh, uh, it went from 169 to 201. Uh, from carded messages, 117 to 180. So it, it's really progressing really well. And when we look at the AR flags, one of the big topic uh, of today, the AR flag went from zero to 90. So it's it's honestly super uh, um, comforting to see that uh, uh, there is really a will to go forward. Uh, readiness is not reached at 100%, but still uh, we're getting there. Now, when I see or when I hear again all the presenters, um, uh, data quality. Data quality is extremely important. It could lead to uh, non-acceptance, so rejection of uh, shipments. Uh, no one wants this to happen, so I urge everyone to look into data quality. Um, should you wish to receive guidance, I mean, again, the standard is available. Uh, you can ask us again to, to share. You can find them on websites. Uh, this is something that can be found. So please make sure that you have a system in place to provide quality. Uh, we also heard a lot about... Uh, some of the unanswered questions, and we are still working on it regarding assessment complete, regarding transit transshipment scenarios and so on. This is something that is still uh, uh, going on. We will try, as uh, Nermin was saying during her presentation, and I think also you, Jan, uh, to get uh, to reach a consensus on, on implementation, on a gradual implementation, because we know that it's not going to be feasible from today to tomorrow. So we really need to have a, uh, an implementation happening, but we also need to ensure that we can show progress. This is extremely important. Um, timely responses is certainly key. Uh, we need also to uh, ensure that from uh, the customs authorities, we will get the responses in a timely manner. Uh, otherwise, it can disrupt the operation and uh, nothing will move. So this is extremely important that from the uh, regulatory authorities, from the governments we receive also, uh, customs authorities, we receive also uh, the required information in due time. Um, I also 
also remind everyone that it's uh, uh, very important to have a, an excellent communication between your um, customers, customer airline, customer posts, uh, and also your uh, authorities. Um, extremely important so that you know who is in charge of what, not that suddenly someone is not in compliance. Um, uh that's that um there are solutions out there again some uh, carriers are ready some postal operators are ready uh some have already started so that's what we know so solutions are out there we've seen it again from uh, the two it providers here um and also, I just wanted to um, remind you that uh, we discussed here uh, the PLACI regimes. Um, we, we know that in the presentations we have focused on the EU ICS2, but please bear in mind that EU ICS2 is watched by many, many countries around the world. And very soon you will see some uh, copy paste uh, from the United Arab Emirates, for example, Canada is looking into it, UK is looking into it, US is looking into it, even Brazil is looking into it. So you will see that little by little, every year we will see some new countries with uh, similar requirements. So let's make it happen. Let's make it happen correctly um, so that we can replicate it uh, with other uh, countries, other areas in the world, uh, because we would love to uh, avoid complexity of having different processes all around the world uh, because something is not working uh, right now. So. Um, I think I'm going to stop here. I've uh, already uh, used way much uh, time than I should have. Um, just again to remind everyone to uh, just follow up with us. Uh, we will, of course, uh, send you the uh, presentations. They will be made available so that you can uh, check again. Um, I think it's interesting to see from the postal operators and the airlines the steps that they have done to accomplish uh, compliance. So I would uh, think it would be good to replicate that. And um, otherwise, I think that's about that. We will organize another webinar uh, maybe in a few months. Uh, we'll see also the results of uh, the implementation by postal operators and airlines and the new readiness. Uh, hopefully, we will be able to announce that everyone is ready. We'll see that at the next webinar. And uh, that's about it on my side. I hope you did enjoy. Thank you again for the 342 remaining participants uh, for being here late and uh, see you next time. Thank you very much. Jan, over to you. Thank you very much, Andre. I think that uh, there is not uh, too much to add. Maybe I'd like to uh, encourage again, all carriers interested in compliance project contact UPU. You, you mentioned, Andre, how data quality is extremely important. We, mm, you mentioned also a uh, uh, webinar or, or the, 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 the meeting organized uh, by the IATA next week. In the same time, we organize also a, a big uh, event in Tokyo with participation of uh, WCO, UPU, uh, carriers uh, or, or um, European Commission. So if we have any uh, additional or latest information, we will, we will share with you. Uh, and uh, we hope that uh, we will use the time remaining until 1st of July to, impl to, to pilot even more uh, uh, links and be uh, even better ready than uh, we presented at the beginning. Once again, thanks uh, to all great speakers today. Uh, we apologize for small problems, technical problems during the uh, beginning. But uh, I hope it was well useful, and uh, we we can promise that uh, uh, we will organize uh, uh, some other uh, webinars together with IATA very soon. Thank you very much. Goodbye. <laughs>